In several reports, we've raised the issue of trans care for adolescents, care for those suffering from gender dysphoria, and want help implementing a gender reassignment. After that, several authorities have reviewed the health care given, not least so that those who undergo the care will not regret it later. On the same day our report was broadcast, in October 2019, one of Sweden's most famous trans persons, Alexa Lundberg, told us that she's not sure she would have done her surgeries and hormone treatments today. When I came here to the Aktulet studio in the SBT building, it was a very sensitive thing to do. I was extremely nervous and knew I was doing the right thing, but also that what I would say would be misunderstood and misinterpreted. Alexa had been a well-known role model for many in the trans movement. 18 years old, she sought health care to become a woman. She has never before spoken of the thoughts of regret she carried. The same day that our report was broadcast, she broke the silence. I've never said I regret, but nevertheless, I have to be clear about that if I had faced the choice today, I might not have had the surgery. The hardest thing to say about myself is precisely the word regret. But the reason I don't refer to myself as a regretter or say I regret is because this is a decision you can't regret. I will have to live with the consequences of these surgeries that I did, these hormone treatments. In two documentaries, we examined the care of adolescents suffering from gender dysphoria, the feeling that you are born in the wrong body and suffering from it. We've told about people who regretted their sex reassignment, something it was taboo to talk about. Those who were open about their regret were met with hatred, scorn, and harassment. It's so terribly taboo. I think you look at it as a scary threat to the classic trans narrative. Living as detransitioned is not something you would want, not a fun reality. That Micah doesn't dare show her face is a very strong image. Someone hiding in the shadows wants to come forward, but does not dare. Isn't that what all struggle for human rights is basically about? That we shouldn't have to hide or be ashamed? This drives me a lot. In the last decade, referrals to gender reassignment have increased sharply. The majority are young. The healthcare and interest groups have worked for fast tracking. In 2018, the government presented a bill to lower the age limit for genital surgery to 15 years of age so that young people would be able to speed up the transition. Gender Identity Clinic for Children, KID, now shows that referrals suddenly decreased. The decrease in the last quarter of 2019, compared with that of 2018, is 65%. The GID service believes that this is partly due to the media attention. As of 2020, only child psychiatric health care providers can refer to the service. After our first trans train program, several authorities were commissioned to investigate on what knowledge the gender dysphoria health care is based. In December 2019, the first of these reports arrived. Jan, can you come a bit closer, please? Jan Adolfsson led the project to investigate the knowledge base, assigned by the government to their medical expert division. 
All healthcare must be based on science and proven medicine, evidence-based medicine. But is this valid for the care of the recent adolescent group with gender dysphoria? There are only a few studies of children and young. Those studies often refer to children and young from before this rise in referrals from about a decade ago. What would you say are the implications of this? If this group that has emerged in the recent decades is different compared to those who came earlier, then we really don't know how this group, which results and issues are relevant for them. It is mainly girls who are responsible for the increase in the number of patients, many with other psychiatric diagnoses. Doctors are alerting that they don't think all feel better from treatment, and so there is not enough research available. What does it mean that there is no scientific basis for the treatments? It is entirely a matter for the clinicians and those who take care of them to judge what is right or wrong. But when you sit with a particular individual in front of you, you have to deal with it in some way. I turned to transgender health care at the age of 18 for investigation of gender identity. Clearly, I applied for transgender care because I had believed that there was a more scientific basis for this. Obviously. I would likely not do this correction today. I have waited as long as I possibly could to express my truth and my views on these matters. I understand that there are young people who have taken decisions based on the narrative in the public space at that time. I felt that I have denied them a more complex narrative. I think we have to be more open also about disappointment and regret. Simply put, so that those who come after us can make better decisions. One argument for fast-tracking the care is that young with gender dysphoria feel so bad that otherwise they would take their lives. This argument is being used in order to lower the age for genital surgery. It says so in the report behind the government proposed bill. But our investigation showed there was no factual basis for this assertion. I can't respond to that. I can't remember. That it is supposed to be connected with those specific surgeries. About age limits, it says explicitly that it is important to pay attention to young transsexuals that may take their lives waiting for surgery. Yes. How come it was written like that if you don't have evidence for it? Yeah. I can't answer that, how come and why it was written like that. It should have said instead that young trans persons take their lives because of the living conditions they are living under. This is unfortunate. It is incorrectly phrased. The problem here is that it has not been possible to establish that there is such an increase in suicide risk from postponing treatment. The statements that exist in the preparation of the bill don't seem to have a clear support. This makes it difficult to see what the connection is. Also, Lars Sandman, professor in medical ethics, failed to find evidence that young take their lives waiting for surgery. 
the bill to lower the age limit to 15 years of age for bottom surgery, went out on a hearing but was obstructed by the Council of Legislation. In connection with our documentary, the government commissioned a re-evaluation of the issue. Lars Sandman did the ethical analysis. Based on a precautionary principle, I concluded that we should probably abstain from bottom surgery for 15-year-olds. One should rather wait until the individual is close to 18 years. The reasons against it are a number of arguments. There is evidence for the older group, but not for the younger. There have been no studies. It is an irreversible procedure. It, it cannot be reversed. A decision that shapes the person's entire future life. Then you have to be reasonably confident that it brings a lasting and significant benefit to the person. As a referral body, the National Board of Health and Welfare was previously positive to lowering the age limit, but this time the NBHW, which is the Swedish Knowledge Authority for Healthcare, made a complete U-turn. A lot speaks against a lowered age limit for certain genital surgeries. It doesn't matter what we have said, we have not felt bound by it. We have investigated the issue from the beginning with the information we now have. We have quite a fast increase and we see a comorbidity. Neuropsychiatric disability and severe psychiatric illness. This affects decisions. We don't have sufficient evidence to be able to say that it is safe with an age limit below 18 years of age. This fast increase in the number of people who ask for the treatment, previously we didn't quite see that, something your feature programs contributed to illuminate. The fate of the new bill is not clear. The Minister of Social Affairs is busy with the COVID epidemic and does not have time to meet us. Are we ready? We're ready to go. Welcome to the pod where we bob on the surface, but aren't afraid to dive to the bottom. How are you, Alexa Lundberg? I'm fine, thanks. Alexa's move provoked reactions. Trans activists criticized her, and she was expelled from a trans group on social media after appearing on the TV news, but has become stronger by the decision. It is very healing and very fragile. It is sort of a process to stay open, but it is positive. It was sensitive, but it's also liberating, very liberating. I feel more complete today. When I can talk about my background as gay, Perhaps I would have lived as gay if I hadn't done this. I hope nobody thinks this is wrong to be a gay feminine man or being a feminine homosexual man with a female body because that is what I am today.